Uh, Let us take one last example on that and then we will raise an important issue about PC and we will try to answer that. Okay. So, this is the final example we take. So, that It is not a difficult one, I think you can do it mentally without any writing. Yeah, can you see? Huh? Just use redux word of Saddam. Okay. You say that this happens if and only if the set x not y and x implies y is inconsistent. Right, and this is inconsistent is obvious, fine, because you can have a proof like x, then not y, x implies y. All these are premises. Then use modus ponens on x and x implies y to get y. Right, so y and not y are present, so it is inconsistent. Is that clear? This will be useful. We'll see where. So, first thing is we will raise that important issue. The issue is this we had started from defining the propositional logic itself by first starting with the set of all propositions that could be gener generated syntactically using the connectives and so on. Then we just carved out whatever are important or are very interesting to us, they are the valid propositions or the valid consequences. Okay, and that came through defining the semantics by interpretations and models. Then we came to propositional calculus, where we just concentrated on two connectives instead of all the five. Right? The other three could be introduced through dedux, uh, definitions, or even the propositional constants, top and bottom can be introduced through definitions. Right? For example, top you can introduce as p implies p. Okay? Take any theorem for that purpose or even bottom you can introduce by not of top or not of p implies p and so on. So, then the question is uh, that is also another way of looking at uh, a subset of the set of all propositions which use these two connectives not and implies. So, the set of propositions is all those theorems of P c. Right? So, on one hand in P l you have the valid propositions and on the other hand you have p c where you have the theorems right do they match that is the issue. Okay. So, this matching can be brought into two um, parts one is whatever you deduce in p c whether they are valid and whatever you find that to be valid in p l whether they are theorems in p c or not is the issue clear okay. and this is about validity and theorem mode. The same way you can ask the question about consequences. Suppose there is a P C consequence, that means a consequence in P C which you have a proof for it, it is a provable consequence. Then you ask whether this provable consequence is a valid consequence in P L and conversely. Right? So, usually what happens is uh, if you have this latter issue settled, then the first issue is also settled. Is that clear? Because suppose you say that sigma entails W entails in PC, right? Sigma entails W in PC. Uh, you also can prove that sigma semantically entails W. That consequence is also valid. Then, as a particular case, you take sigma to be empty set, right? So that settles the issue that if something is a PC theorem, it is also PL valid. Is it clear? So, this is the reason we say the corresponding issue for consequences are stronger results. Right? So, let us formulate, give them some names. So, one is you say uh, soundness of P C. So, when you say soundness of P C, it is with respect to P L. If you take another logic, 
probability is not sound. So, all that we have is P C and P L. So, we say with respect to P L. So, this issue is if W is a theorem. So, once it is a theorem, it is theorem in P C that is our standard notation we are following right. Then W is also valid this is called the soundness. When you say the strong soundness soundness of P C with respect to P L that will say if sigma entails W in P C then sigma entails W in P L. Okay. So, this is the way we will be using those two words soundness and strong soundness. Similarly, you can think of completeness completeness of P C with respect to P L. So, that will look like if W is valid then it has a proof in P C. Okay. On the same way you have strong completeness which says if sigma entails W is a valid consequence in P L then sigma entails W is provable in P C right. Now, we think that it should hold otherwise you would not have done P C hmm. because we have the valid ones we want to see that they are still captured by some other formal game playing hmm. of with the symbols not exactly coming to the truth or falsity right that is what we wanted to see. So, now to prove it what do we do see here we are cheating a bit we know that it is strongly sound the system is strongly sound. So, we will not prove this we will simply try this prove it then bring it as a corollary the same way for this also strong completeness okay, may be a reformulation of it, but we will tackle strong completeness strong soundless directly since we know that they are going to be true huh? that is why. Okay, now, for the strong soundness let us see sigma is a set of propositions w is a proposition now suppose that sigma entails w as a proof then how are we going to prove that sigma entails w in p l. Hmm. and m p is valid then. So, that gives you one step of applying m p or taking the axioms many steps induction huh? okay. So, proof is clear it should hold huh? this is happening because each of the axioms in p c is a valid proposition in p l that is to be checked right. Then what do we do m p as a consequence is also a valid consequence in P L then apply induction right. So, inductively you may not prove everything at a time what you do is uh, you start with suppose sigma entails W that means there is a proof of sigma entails W. Now, our proof of soundness is by induction on the number of propositions occurring in the proof in fact, occurring in any proof of any consequence not only of sigma entails w that is what we are going to prove right. Sigma is any set there w is any proposition there and you take any proof there. Okay. Now, suppose it is a one line proof that is our basis case of the induction if it is one line proof then w is an either an axiom or it is a premise in sigma right. Now, you verify whether each axiom is valid or not you verify it by truth table let us say crudely. Okay. So, now once that is over you say that sigma semantically entails w by what if it is a premise then sigma entails w in P L that is clear and if it is 
an axiom then anything will enter monotonicity right that's basically monotonicity so that step is done basic step is done next for the induction step what do you do suppose there is a proof with m propositions where uh, it may not be that sigma any gamma enters v that is given and it is a proof of gamma enters v for that you assume the induction hypothesis that gamma enters v in pl right now you proceed to the <coughs> induction step suppose sigma enters w has a proof which has m plus 1 steps so you are using really strong induction less than m plus 1 not only for exactly m fine so now suppose it has m plus 1 number of propositions in a proof fine then w is the last line how this w has been obtained again there will be cases it can be a premise in sigma it can be an axiom it might have been obtained by application of modus ponens mp right so if it is an axiom or it is a premise it is a like the basis case it's already run otherwise it has been followed by mp so there is one proposition v such that v occurs in that proof earlier to this w and there is also v implies w which occurs earlier to it now apply induction hypothesis on both of them so you get different proofs possibly right not proofs so you say that by induction hypothesis sigma enters v in pl sigma enters v implies w in pl now you apply modus ponens of pl right which says v and v implies w semantically enters w that proves sigma enters w is that clear so we'll not write the proof okay hmm? you don't get time it's all right you can write at home then let's proceed to the completeness of pc with respect to pl again we will be tackling strong completeness so that means if sigma enters w semantically in pl then sigma enters w in pc that's what we are going to see right there are again two approaches here one is you start with sigma find out all that can be deduced from sigma okay and proceed along with that that is called the deductive closure of sigma and there is another approach which says you just extend sigma to a consistent set right we will follow the second approach see what happens so for that purpose we will first reformulate this strong completeness we have to bring consistency and satisfiability okay even if you see strong soundness if you reformulate it how does it look well first is sigma union not w is inconsistent right sigma enters w means sigma union not w is inconsistent so you say if sigma union not w is inconsistent then sigma union not w is unsatisfiable right so which is equivalent to telling if sigma union not w is satisfiable right then sigma union not w is consistent okay so you forget sigma union not w take an arbitrary set even so you say if sigma is a any arbitrary set of propositions that is satisfiable then it is consistent do you see so that is the reformulation of strong soundness let's write it what we have proved already is this it says if sigma is satisfiable then sigma is consistent <coughs> is it clear is the reformulation clear see if you look at this it says it is satisfiable then it is consistent if you see by contraposition it is sigma is inconsistent then sigma is unsatisfiable so as a particular case sigma union not w is inconsistent implies sigma union not w is unsatisfiable 
which is equivalent to redox or absurdum in both PC and PL we are using right equivalent to sigma n tells W then sigma n tells W in PL right that is strong soundness. Now, similar formulation in strong completeness will be just converse of this it will be if sigma is consistent then sigma is satisfiable. Okay. That also you can see easily, it is not difficult. This thing is same thing as telling sigma is unsatisfiable, implies sigma is inconsistent. So, take particular sigma, sigma union not w. Sigma union not w is unsatisfiable, then sigma union not w is inconsistent. So, which is telling sigma n tells w semantically, implies sigma n tells w in PC syntactically huh, in PC. Is it clear? So, this is the formulation we are going to tackle with. Now, let us see what does this formulation says. Suppose, sigma is a singleton set right having a proportional variable. How does it look? Suppose, this is my sigma. So, when I say this is consistent, it is consistent right. Now, how do you say it is satisfiable? Well, you can just assign one interpretation i, i of p equal to 1, it is satisfiable, right. But that is not what is inside this statement. Once you say this is consistent by deductions, you will see, for example, axiom 1 says p implies q implies p. So, you deduce q implies from p from this also, right. So, once p is consistent, p along with its consequence which is q implies p should also be consistent. Do you see the problem? Huh? No? See suppose p is there only p is there now use axiom 1 deduce q implies p from this that is ok it is deducible right. So, look at the other side you have p and p also entails q implies p in P L forget this proof right P implies Q implies P as in P L right that is also satisfiable if P is satisfiable P along with Q implies P is also satisfiable the same model I because by definition if P entails Q implies P then I of P if that is 1 then I of Q implies P is also 1. So, that set is also satisfiable with the same model here in P C what happens you have P along with that you have q implies p that also should be consistent if at all they are matching right. So, once you assume only p it is not only p you are concerned with you are concerned with all those things which can be deduced from it along with sigma all of them should be consistent right. See because in consistency what happens your assumption is you cannot deduce q and not q both from the same that is assumed. Okay. So, soundness says if this is consistent whatever you deduce from this also will be giving rise to the other side now soundness says if you deduce something from this that also along with this should be consistent right because on the other side it says only entailment semantic entailment all those will be entailed by this soundness. So, when you look at it look at the converse if this theorem is true look at the converse that is your completeness which says along with p all the other things should also be consistent. Is it clear? So, because of interplay of soundness and completeness this is what we are at. If p is consistent as a single term then along with p all its conclusions that follow from p should also be consistent and there are infinitely many now because from this itself q implies p q can be replaced by any proposition right. And if you use axiom 2 or axiom 3 something more might come. So, there is potential and infinite set here which should become consistent fine. And what else we need to do here 
if some set is consistent like P, we actually should produce one model of that set. Okay. Now, we see that if it is a model, it will be a model of the whole set along with that all its conclusions. Okay. So, it is a big problem. Huh? Now, first to realize what is the problem, then we will be tackling it. If it is very big, then you have to start in a bigger way. Okay. So, this is the bigger way we will be starting with. Since this is coming up and we do not know what are the propositions which will be consistent with this set, we will start with an enumeration of all propositions and find out which are really consistent with this set. Okay. So, that is the big approach we are taking now. Okay. Can we have an enumeration of all the propositions? Yes, can you have? Hmm? Yes, set of all propositions. Can we have an enumeration? So, enumeration means what? This is my first proposition, this is my second proposition, and so on. If you can do that, it is an enumeration. Yes, can you do that? Huh? Yes, why yes? Suppose we sort them by links and then links. We can sort it. Hmm. We can enumerate. It is an infinite set. You can't sort. So the algorithm will not finish. It will not talk. Well, that gives you the hint. The set is countable or not? Huh? It is. So it can be enumerated. That's it. Is it okay? See the set of all propositions is countable because you are starting with a countable set of symbols and then formulating it along with a grammar, right? Okay. First, the take the set of all symbols, then combine, take the set of all expressions possible from it. That is again countable. Expressions, each expression has a finite length, right? Okay, that's starting. What you told, each expression is a finite length. It is a finite sequence of symbols. So, set of all finite sequence of symbols from a countable set will be countable, right? Therefore, the set of all propositions is countable. And then the set of all PC propositions, we are concerned with only two connectives here, not all the other connectives. That is also countable. So, if it is countable, there is an enumeration, whichever way you enumerate, does not matter. But we are going to fix the enumeration. Whichever way you have done, you keep it to yourself, give me the enumeration. Accordingly, I will proceed. That is the approach. Fine? Countable. Countable or finite? Countable. As we have defined, it is countable P0, P1, P2, P3, and so on. So, it is countable. Okay? So, now let us take an enumeration of all the propositions. Right, we start from there. So, suppose W0, W1, and so on is an enumeration of the set of all propositions. All, in fact, we will not write after this PC, always it will be. P C propositions we are concerned with. Okay. From now onwards, up to up to some point of time till we finish the completeness proof. So it is the set of all P C propositions. Now what we do? We start with sigma zero, and slowly define and extend it. Right. So define a sequence of sets of propositions. Okay. So define. Sigma, uh, let's write say sigma m. It is a sequence of propositions we are defining for m in natural numbers, as follows. First, take sigma zero equal to sigma. We start with sigma. Right. Next, once it is defined, you take sigma m plus one equal to sigma m. If sigma m union 
W m is inconsistent. Okay, and it is equal to sigma m union W m if otherwise, right? If sigma m union W m is consistent, that is our definition of the sequence of sets of propositions sigma m. Then finally, you take sigma prime, which is our main object here, right? Equal to union of all these things. Is the construction clear? We are constructing it inductively. Okay, sigma zero is sigma. Next, sigma one. How do you get sigma one? Well, you go to W zero. Whatever enumeration you have taken, in that. Take the first one, W zero. Now verify whether sigma union W zero is consistent or inconsistent. It's not very algorithmic. How to verify it is inconsistent? Huh? But it's a theoretical construction. So if it is inconsistent, then do not include that W zero. You be happy with sigma zero. Call it sigma one. Right? So sigma zero and sigma one are same now. W zero we are just omitting. If it is consistent, then include this W1 and form a new set. Call it sigma1. Okay, and proceed. That's how the definition goes. Then finally, you write sigma prime as the union of all those sigma i's. Okay. So what it says here is that if i is less than j or equal to j, then Sigma i is a subset of sigma j. Is it clear? Yes. Because each time you are not deleting anything, you are adding possibly, possibly. So you don't know whether it will be a proper subset. It will be a subset. That's what we can say. Okay. Next, what we observe is each. Sigma i is consistent. Okay, that observation is clear. Each sigma i is consistent. You need an inductive proof for that again, but it's clear from the construction. Okay. Fine. That's how it is proceeding. Whichever is out of these or these. If it is consistent, only you are keeping it. Otherwise, don't add. So earlier was consistent. Now also it is consistent. Our assumption is that sigma is consistent. Okay. So now what happens? But we have really extended it too much. It is very large now. It is something like limit of sigma n n goes to infinity. Okay. We don't have the limit concept. We write as union. That's the idea. So now we will find out some nice properties of this sigma prime. See what happens. Okay. So first property. Well, let's have a point. Uh, we should start from sigma is consistent. Everywhere we are using it, and because of this assumption, this is consistent. Okay. Fine. So first property is finiteness. Huh? Suppose you take sigma prime. Say so sigma prime uh, gives you W in some derivation. Okay. Then you say that there is a k such that sigma k also enters W. Can you see that? Hmm? If Sigma prime entails W, whatever proposition W may be, right? Then sigma k entails W for some k. Hmm? 
hmm, it comes from the finiteness of the proofs. See once you say sigma prime and tells w, there is a proof of it. Okay. In that proof, you have only premises from sigma prime used, w may not be there in sigma prime, somewhere else possibly, we do not know. Right? Well, there are premises from sigma prime used, now those premises are in the enumeration, because it is a set of all propositions, they are in the enumeration. Okay. So, then take the highest index. Okay. Some k, not any. There is one k, there exists one k such that sigma k enters w. Okay. So, take that highest index, take that as your k, that includes all those premises earlier. So, sigma k must enter w, because there is a proof for it, the same proof holds for sigma k enters w. Huh? Is it clear? Idea is clear? See, I will repeat. Suppose, sigma prime enters w has a proof p, then take all the premises occurring in p. Okay. Is that clear? Now, all those premises are from the sets sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 and so on, from somewhere they belong because sigma prime is union of sigma k s. Right? Now, take the maximum index of that in our enumeration, define that as your k, then sigma k contains all those premises. Okay? Now, sigma k enters w, because the same proof p is a proof of sigma k enters w, because all the premises are from sigma k. Sigma k may not be equal to sigma prime. For any k for which it is equal, will definitely you do not know if sigma converges. I am not able to follow your question. Can you repeat? It is asking if there exists a case of that sigma k is equal to sigma prime. We do not know. Right? See, that may not happen because suppose sigma is a finite set. Right? Then sigma k is always a finite set, but sigma prime is infinite. Right? So that may not happen. Okay? But what it says that if sigma prime enters W one proposition, then for that W you will have one k, such that sigma k will enter W. Now let us see. So this property is clear. Hmm? So we go to next property. <coughs> Okay. Sigma prime is consistent. Is it so? Can you see why sigma prime is consistent? Hmm? No. Construction says each sigma i is consistent. Why the union is consistent? Hmm? See, this concept is this consistency can be taken to the limit that does not always happen, right? Whatever idea you say that may not be carried over to the limit. Right. It is the last n which we mean. There is no last n. Okay, <laughs> so, essentially, at the limit, uh, the, uh, the n will be same as. Uh, Right, that is, that is what you want to show, is it? That is what this sentence says. That is what exactly this sentence says. Sigma prime is consistent. That is consistency is carried over to the limit. Suppose you are not consistent. Hmm. You have to give a proof. Huh? You have to give a proof. We should not have any more induction now. Huh? It's very crisp now. Okay, if sigma prime is inconsistent. Uh, then what happens? I have sigma prime enters some u, 
sigma prime entails some not u for some proposition u right. Now, by the property 1 I get sigma i entails u for some i this i is fixed by that u okay. and also sigma j entails not u this j is fixed by not u it need not be that i take the larger of i and j call that k. So, now sigma k by monotonicity entails u sigma k also entails not u because sigma i sigma j both are subsets of that right. Now, that sigma k entails both u and not u sigma k is inconsistent that contradicts our observation that each sigma is consistent is it clear. Okay. So, the construction is nice. Huh? So, it is not only consistent, it is maximally consistent. So, maximally consistent means it is consistent and if you add another proposition to it, it becomes inconsistent right. Is that okay? Why is it so? So, we have already proved that it is consistent. We have to only see that if you add something else which is not in sigma prime, then the new set becomes inconsistent right. So, let us write it first what we want to show. Suppose V does not belong to sigma prime, then we must show that sigma prime union V is inconsistent. This is what we are supposed to show. Sigma dash union that W j if it is consistent then sigma, sigma dash j will contain W j by the definition. Sigma j itself should I mean yes. Then uh, sigma j contains uh, W j. Yeah, it should contain. So that means it should have already contained. But we are assuming it does not belong to the set. Let V uh -huh. equal to some W j in the enumeration of all the Ws. Okay. What you say is this V. Is some WJ is equal to WJ, yes. right? Then uh, sigma J. Suppose V equal to WJ. Then sigma, sigma J is contained in sigma prime. Then sigma J is contained in sigma sigma prime. So if sigma prime sigma union J is, is a subset of sigma prime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if sigma prime union uh, V is consistent, mm -hmm. then uh, sigma J union uh, V would have also been consistent. Why? Uh, that is monotonicity. Monotonicity, yeah. Right. So if sigma a, j plus. If a set is consistent, then its subset is also consistent. That is monotonicity. Okay. So sigma j union W j is consistent. Then. Which means uh, sigma j plus one contains W j. Mm. Sigma j plus one will have a member as W j. So. So sigma prime contains W j. Which is in contradiction to V does not belong to sigma. Is it clear? Proof is over. Huh? Okay, let us write it. So, let V be equal to W j in the enumeration. Okay. Then what we say? Sigma j is a subset of sigma j. So, in fact, we need sigma j union v, right? But okay, let's try with that. If sigma j is a subset of sigma prime, and sigma prime union v is consistent, then sigma j union v is also consistent. 
right because sigma j union v is a subset of sigma prime union v okay by monotonicity then what happens sigma j plus 1 should be equal to sigma j union v because v equal to w j right next we argue since sigma j plus 1 is a subset of sigma prime v should have been in sigma prime but v is not Decide for yourself what will happen. He is not able to that's why he is asking. Huh? Why is it consistent? Because uh, you cannot. Uh, uh, well, if it is inconsistent, right? Then what happens? You have a proof of sigma union W and tells you sigma union W and tells not you, right? So, in this proof, W has possibly been used. Now, you can eliminate that use because it follows from sigma. So, you can con always construct a proof of sigma n tells u, sigma n tells not u. That is it. So, from that we can say that uh, uh, if uh, sigma dash uh, prime n tells w, then w does belong to sigma prime. That was the first thing I told you. Okay. Now prove this. Instead of giving that proof, it will be quicker now. Huh? So suppose W belongs to sigma prime, then sigma prime enters W. Obvious. One line proof. Suppose sigma prime enters W. Now you want to show W belongs to sigma prime. Right? Again, if W does not belong to sigma prime. Then sigma prime union W is inconsistent, maximal consistency, right? If W does not belong to sigma prime, by maximal consistency, sigma prime union W is inconsistent, right? So sigma prime enters not W by reduction of absurdum, but sigma prime also enters W. Sigma prime is inconsistent, which is wrong. It's quicker now, right? Is it clear? So which says that sigma prime is its deductive closure. Whatever that can be deduced is already there. Right? So, whatever proposition W you take for every proposition W, huh? that is what it is written here, not written here, read it that way. For any proposition W or each proposition W, either W belongs to sigma prime or not W belongs to sigma prime, one of them will be there. So, it is too large in that sense. Whatever proposition you say, either it is there or its negation is there. Why is it so? Huh? Both cannot be there, right? So one of them should be there. Why? That's what we want. One of them should be there. How? How to show? It? How to show? It? That's what we want to show, right? So first thing is, if W belongs to sigma prime, then 
not W does not belong to sigma prime. Hmm? Why is it so? Due to four. Yeah. Right? Because once you say not W also belongs to sigma prime. <laughs> sigma prime entails also not W. Sigma prime entails W. Sigma prime becomes inconsistent. So this part is clear. Now if W does not belong to sigma prime, then maximal consistency that says sigma prime union W is inconsistent. Redux ad absurdum says sigma prime entails not W, then not W belongs to sigma prime by 4. Okay. So, once you prove maximal consistency, things should go faster. One more property. Huh? Easy. Huh? See, you just use four. Look at property four. Belongs to an entailment or same now in sigma prime. Fine. So once you have to show p implies q belongs to sigma prime, you simply show sigma prime entails p implies q, and that follows because of axiom one. Q implies p implies q. You have already q in sigma prime, so p implies q follows. So, it belongs to can you see this? If P does not belong to sigma prime, then P implies Q belongs to sigma prime. Similar, huh? See, once P does not belong to sigma prime, not P belongs to sigma prime. Okay. Now, not P implies P implies Q is a theorem. Okay. We have already proved it. Just like your axiom there. Q implies P implies Q. We have a theorem not P implies P implies Q that proves. This is something else. Well, today we have proved something. What was it? Look at your notes. That is it, right. See, today we had proved this P not Q entails not of P implies Q. Okay. If P is there in sigma prime. Q does not belong to sigma prime means not Q belongs to sigma prime. Then we have not of P implies Q follows from sigma prime. Then not of P implies Q belongs to sigma prime. Then P implies Q does not belong to sigma prime. Okay. So we stop there.
with all the properties of sigma prime. Then we will see how to use this in proving our main theorem. That should be two lines now after this, huh? because if you see, if you see here fifth one captures the negation symbol and these three 6, 7 and 8 capture the implied symbol. This is the semantics of implies, that is the semantics of negation. So, now you should be able to do it quickly. Okay. 